it's the yeah all right thanks just yeah the first slide all right um yeah so this project um started as a collaboration between the Sydney Informatics Hub and the uh, Badlands Group um as far as I remember I think Deepma approached us at some point um way before lockdown to purchase for a problem in terms of um, how we can optimize basically um, expensive or computation expensive computer simulations, geoscience um, that might require much less uh, runtime. And so this project was born uh, with the goal basically to, to develop an open source uh, package for experiment of design, focus on um, basically um, building setups, design setups for geophysics simulations and the analyzers. Um, your brief outline of, of the seminar talk that I'll be going through today. Um, I'll start with a brief introduction to design of experiment and short DOE. Um, basically talk a bit about design principles, a bit of history and what it is. And then I'll introduce the package that we built to DOE Gen, um, like certain setups, uh, analyzer steps and the stages of the experiment design. And then Henry will take over and talk about the customized uh, Badlands pipeline DOE Gen Geo. Uh, talk about bit about the installation, the pipeline overview, and we'll with, uh, go with you through a scenario on the example of the uh, Badlands Rift model. And I hope um, at the end we have like 50 minutes left over for, for some discussions and, and points that you might think are important. Um, next slide, Henry. Thanks. Um, so let's get started. Uh, what is DOE? Um, it's basically a statistical method um, to design and plan and conduct experiments and to analyze the experiments and to interpret the data. The main goal is basically to choose an experiment setup that maximizes the information uh, while minimi minimizing the costs. In our case, it's minimizing the computation runtime for, for simulations. Um, it has a large range of use cases from uh, variable screening, feature engineering, system optimization and, and transfer function identification for, for instance, signal processing. And it's been used across uh, lots of disciplines, uh, particularly for like expensive pharmaceutical trials um, and industrial processes, research experiments. In agriculture, is, it has a big role, uh, product optimization. And of course, at last but least in, in computer simulations, uh, such as in geoscience. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, let's start first with a few uh, definitions. As I said, like the goal of DOE is to minimize the number of trials uh, that are conducted without basically compromising the integrity of the data analyzers. Um, I'll use some, some certain terms in, in the following slides. So I just want to make sure that we're on the same page. Uh, when I say factor, it's basically factor or, or feature. It's the uncontrolled or controlled input variable, um, like in our case, in, in the simulations, it's, it can be like tectonic plate shifts and so on, um, like all those uh, parameters that go in a simulation. And they can be continuous, discrete, or categorical. Level is basically a specific value or setting for a factor. So each factor can have multiple levels, depending on how, how fine grained, of course, you want to have sensitivity of the experiment with regard to this factor. Uh, the response variable is just the output, which is measured or observed, for instance, elevation. Then the effect is uh, yeah, the change in the response variable. And interactions is basically um, if, if multiple factors interact with each other, it can affect uh, the response depending on, um, on the factor of, of another factor, for instance, for two-way interactions. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, so traditionally, um, what happens often, also happens to me often, um, when I start modeling um, or build a model, I, I, I go from one, I do with one factor at a time, basically analyzes at some point without even realizing um, that I'm doing maybe not the optimal thing. Um, so let's say you want to have a model that predict yield um, and you uh, check for a factor of time. Um, you go for a couple of parameters and see where it uh, has its maximum yield. Uh, then you fix this parameters at a maximum here at 1,200. Uh, next slide, please. And then you look at the other factor, let's say it's temperature, um, do the same thing here, um, see where it's maximum and, and you think, oh, that's good. Um, we choose these two parameters. Um, but you can see here, this is basically the summary of these uh, two factors in space. Um, next slide, please, uh, which is not really optimal. Um, and we would consider like that factors often uh, or frequently interact, uh, which you can see here on the right. In this case, I uh, would have found a suboptimal solution um, and, and it actually we would have missed greatly the, the best solution in this case um, on, the, on the top left. Uh, yeah, so um, next slide, please. 
out of this need, um, particularly in the early 20th century, uh, we'll talk a bit more about history here, um, uh, due to the um, strong uh, revolutions in agriculture and industrial processes, um, people have started to think about a more sophisticated way to design experiments. Ronald Fisher, the name it's surely familiar with from, from ANOVA test, IF test, which uh, he was basically um, trying to optimize uh, research and the output in agriculture, uh, for instance, increasing the uh, crop yield in the, in the UK. Um, George Box is another important figure. Um, uh, he was involved in the 50s by optimizing and using um, the variation in chemical manufacturing processes. And Genichi Taguchi um, in the 60s is famous for um, developing a lot of uh, methods um, for industrial process optimization. Next slide. A lot of these um, designs that have been developed in the last century are still used today. Um, here's a brief overview. Um, on the top left, we have the uh, full factorial design. This is basically just uh, the anti-combination of factor levels, um, which is obviously not optimal because uh, it will, can be very large. Um, it's known as grid search in some cases. Um, the fraction factorial design is, as the name implies, uh, just basically a fraction of the full factorial, uh, which can be either, for instance, uh, can be built uh, via multiple ways. Uh, one way is, for instance, uh, by the central composite designs, also known as Box and Wilson design on the, on the top left or the uh, box banking design on a, on a middle um, button, um, which basically uses the midpoint between, between the edges as, 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 as set up parameters and, and the center as well. Um, one more uh, design that you might be more familiar with is the latent hypercube design on, on the right here. Actually, it's a latent square in this case with two factors. And this is constructed uh, given just a simple rule that you have uh, that only one, uh, that, that a certain setting for each factor cannot be repeated so that um, there's no overlap in settings for each factor. Um, all those designs are pretty uh, simple to construct, but often they have only uh, they prefer one or two design criteria and, and lack in, a, in, in other efficiencies. Uh, for instance, the latent hypercube design can perform very purely in the orthogonality um, constraint which I'll talk a bit later, um, which also uh, leads to pretty low uh, information um, uh, matrices and, and designs in this case. Um, next slide, please. Um, DOHN, um, before we talk about DOHN, uh, just a brief overview about the typical experiment stages that we have. So experiment starts typically with uh, the input factors we think about. It can be real measurements such as temperature, time for, for measurement, or can be simulation parameters. Then um, the, uh, the experiment uh, design stage happens. Um, basically, you would like to build an optimal set of parameters for the design. Then the experiment is conducted, um, can be your measurements or you run the simulations. And then the output of the experiments is, is analyzed with respect to yield cost or the, um, or the error rate in the simulation predictions. So DOGEN um, focuses and it's built um, uh, focus on uh, two main components. Um, first on the automatic generation of efficient experiment design setups. And, and second on the analysis and visualization of the experiment results. Um, the most tricky part um, for building a software package is actually the first step. Um, I think most of the time went into this because that's not as, as easy as it sounds. Um, and I'll explain a bit more on the next slide. Um, um, yeah, well, let's go first quickly through the, through the setup. Um, here we see a typical uh, setup of DOGEN. Um, we made it pretty easy to provide just a spreadsheet or CSV um, file where you enter the number of parameters or factors on the left, uh, what kind of parameter type it is, continuous, discrete, or categorical, then the number of levels or settings. In this case, they're all, all free. And then um, they were distributed between a user uh, chosen minimum and a maximum set. Um, here in this case, um, let's say we have nine parameters and they all just have only three levels that would result in a full factorial um, of to 19,683 um, uh, combinations, which is way too, too long to run through in an experiment typically on a, and it takes a few hours to run a simulation on this. Um, so 
So the traditional methods, um, so the goal is basically to build a fraction factorial. Um, so only use a subset of the, of the experiments. And for that, one has to look into um, a couple of design criteria to optimize. Um, that's not as easy. Um, in principle, um, you might think, oh, you could, or could calculate all the design criteria for the almost 20,000 combinations. But if you select or want to select a set of 100 out of these numbers, you have to run it into permutation base, which is almost infinite number of permutations then. Um, so you can't just use a brute force algorithm and go for all the permutations, uh, which is in this case actually to the power of, I think, 420 or 430. <laughs> I tried to calculate it. Um, so that's uh, it's very challenging. And uh, one has to basically use some approximation methods um, to, to build its designs. Next slide, please. Um, for certain designs, uh, for low number of factors and, and just certain settings, um, there are some tables listed for the optimal designs. But for most designs, uh, one has to, for, for more factors, one has to um, use approximation techniques. So some of the important design criteria here listed here. First, we have the experiment costs. Um, obviously, you want to minimize them. That's um, pretty, pretty clear. Then center balance is just basically you want to balance for each factor the levels around the center. Uh, level balance um, is basically main effects and, and the interaction terms, which means you want to have for each, for each, uh, each level, you want to have as, as the same frequency. And for instance, if you have two interaction balances, you want to have the combination or pairwise combination of each level settings at the same frequency mentioned in the, in the setup. Um, orthogonality, um, that's the more tricky one. Um, so basically you, want, you don't want to introduce any correlation between any combination of factors. Um, so they are all orthogonal to each other in the setup. And, and it sounds more easy than it is to achieve. That's actually one of the most difficult parts to, to achieve in a, in a setup design. And for instance, latent hypercube is often a very pure orthogonality. Um, Another design criteria is obviously you want to reach a high variance, um, like you want to spend the entire range parameter settings um, with, with minimal overlap. And then there are a couple of model dependent efficiencies. Um, they're called like the one, the two A efficiencies and so on. They're all based more or less on the information gain of the model and, and they're like defined by a certain determinant of the uh, information matrix, the inverse information matrix. Um, without going much further into detail here, let's go to the next slide. Um, so how what Diogen is doing is basically um, it creates, um, it sets up for each uh, run, it selects an optimal, it finds, tries to build an orthogonal array and tries to optimize it with respect to the design criteria I mentioned on the previous slide. And it repeats this um, for each experimental run size. Uh, it goes for all those experimental runs and evaluates basically all the design criteria um, from center level balance uh, to orthogonality to level balance. You can see an example plot on the top top left. And um, it automatically selects then um, free design um, based on the following criteria, like a minimum design as a certain criteria, minimum number of standards of the criteria. Um, in particular that, uh, for instance, all two level interactions should appear at least once. Um, optimal design has a higher, higher standard and center balance, level balance, orthogonal balance of 50, 95% and two level interaction balance of 95% and um, proposes then the best design based on those um, design criteria. Um, this, is, this can be taken by the user, but also you can also um, are free to use any other of the designs that have been um, created um, as function of number of runs if, if you think this is more um, suitable for your for use case. Um, next slide, please. Um, the last step of the uh, DOG analysis basically analyzes part. Um, so it provides a couple of basic evaluation plots um, based on uh, the ground truth that the experiment is measured against. Um, and uh, one thing is, for instance, parameter space. Uh, what are the best um, parameters on average? Um, then uh, which factors are the most important factors based on the range? I will talk about this a bit later on the, on the use case scenario uh, for badlands, then uh, feature versus response correlations and, and how features correlate with RMS, the RMSE, the would mean squared error of, of the experiment. And we can also look into pair feature device combination of, of response and, and RMSE as well. Next slide. Um, 
So here are summary of the main functionalities of this open source package. Um, so it provides um, the easy input uh, via experiment setup table and you have multiple user option settings. Uh, it generates automatically an optimized design areas it's a function of multiple runs and selects you um, like an optimal best and a minimal design idea. You can, you're also free to specify the, the maximum number of runs that you want to evaluate the designs. Um, then it does have some basic evaluation and visualization um, toolkit to basically, um, uh, yeah, uh, first it um, actually calculates all the uh, design efficiencies, up to 10 design efficiencies here. And it suggests the minimum optimum best designs as mentioned. And you're also able to import um, and evaluate basically an external generated design, let's say with a proprietary software or with some other design generation tools and, and to um, test it with respect to this design efficiencies. And it allows you at the end uh, to plot these uh, results in visualization as we will see later. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, um, the next um, next slides will go over the pipeline. Basically here, the DOGM pipeline um, summarizes all stages and goes from all stages from experiment design, um, executing experiment to the experiment analysis. And I'll hand over to Henry to talk about more about this. Great, thanks, Seb. So what this pipeline actually looks like in, in practice is, is a set of several different components. So the first bit of the pipeline that we have is to run a DOE gen. And once, so DOE gen takes a little, as it's, it runs, it produces at the end, a optimal table of experiments. And that's based on the inputs that you've provided in the um, Excel input document that we have for DOE gen. And so once this set of optimal uh, experiments is created. We then um, pass that to another bit of the pipeline, which then generates a set of Badlands input XML files. And then it, the next stage is to take those input XML files and then run Badlands simulations for each one of them. Then to take the final stage of the pipeline is to take the results, the final output, like the final state of each of those Badlands simulations, and then to bring that back in to the DOE gen evaluation function, DOE val, to compare that with the ground truth to then pick out what's the best experimental design, what experiment you know, performed the best at whatever thing you're trying to do. So the, the ground truth is really important there because basically um, it allows you to you know, compare something that you've you know, gone out there and measured versus what our simulations have generated. So that you know, allows you to see which simulation got the closest to getting something that reflects reality. So how this works in practice, um, basically uh, we ended up uh, using Docker to uh, handle a lot of the issues involved around installation to actually you know, deploy this onto your computers. So if you're not familiar with Docker, Docker is basically the leading um, containerization um, resource out there. And so the simple way to do, we have a full user guide on our um, GitHub repository for the project, but basically just to uh, really quickly sum it up here, uh, we have five different Docker files that are each um, used to uh, run the pipeline. And we have some shell scripts that we have that you can just, you know, easily type in or copy paste into your terminal or um, whatever shell that you're using. And then that will bring in, run all the Docker containers. And it's very seamless. So this is great because it handles all of the different issues with um, different sorts of you know, Python installations. You don't have to worry about any of that. It's all taken care of with the Docker. Um, so that makes it pretty simple there. So as I said before, it just runs through each of these different stages, runs DOE gen to generate your set of experiments then it takes those experiments and then to uh, it creates the Badlands XML files, runs all of your Badlands simulations, takes the results back, compares it, and then provides you with some analysis to decide what was the optimal um, experimental design. So one of the, uh, basically there's, there's more detail about this on the readme and our GitHub, but uh, I'll provide somewhat of an overview right now. Basically, the 
the way to use uh, this pipeline is to clone the repository to your computer and to use this repository file structure that we've put in here to um, run the whole, the whole setup here. So basically what we have is we have these two shell scripts. So first, the first shell script that you'll be using is the Duogen Badlands. That is to run through and create your whole optimal, to run through, generate the optimum table of experiments, create the Badlands XMLs, and then run the Badlands simulations. And then the next stage is to is the uh, evaluation um, shell script, and that's to run the evaluation Docker stuff to generate your, um, and basically to compare your uh, Badlands simulations versus the ground truth that you provided. And to do that, yeah, we have these um, four different Docker files here. And important is this project folder structure. So within the project folder structure, we have the experiment setup Badlands, which is what you um, modify to, as this basically is the input that will be provided to DOGEN. These Python files that we've provided for you are fixed. However, we'll talk a little bit more about this one CSV to badlands.py in a little while, because this is the one of these Python scripts that you could potentially modify depending on this type of Badlands simulation you want to do. Um, we have a set of settings files that are fixed here. Um, then there's the scenario files, which I'll go on later on, which is this is something that users provide. And these are used as part of the input process in generating the Badlands XML files. There's also the data files. These are required for running the Badlands simulations. And if you're not familiar with those particular um, types of CSV files that Badlands requires, there's more information on the Badlands website, but I'm sure all of you are. And then finally, we have this automatically generated results, uh, set of results folders. And that creates the results from your simulations and the whole DOHN, DOE eval uh, process. So, well, it's, it's good to talk about it all just without any examples. I think it's much better if we provide an example. So um, we built this whole pipeline working with the Badlands Rift model, which is a relatively simple Badlands simulation situation. And so we're, I'm just going to spend some time to go over the whole step-by-step -step process here uh, to explain how uh, our pipeline works on a real example with the Rift model. And here are some pretty pictures that are from, I, I believe these are Sarah's pretty pictures. Yeah. They are Tristan's. Oh, Tristan's. Tristan's. Okay, Tristan's pretty pictures to give, to give proper credit. Thank you. <laughs> So the first step is to set the simulation parameter levels in the experimental uh, setup Badlands uh, Excel spreadsheet. And so basically what you do is you have your different parameters that you have the names for it here. Um, and then you specify the type of parameter that it is. You provide the number of possible levels for each parameter, the range here from minimum to maximum. Uh, these are all users specified for them because, um, well, Seb and I have worked with geosciences. You guys are the geoscientists. So it's good for you to set the values here that are actually sensible for your particular simulation environment. Um, you can specify whether or not you want to include these factors within or each of these different parameters within the DOE gen process. And then finally, for the uh, for the items or the parameters that are categorical, you'll provide the levels. Now, so for things like um, the sea level curve component of Badlands, basically this is specifying which sea level you curve you want to um, incorporate into your simulation. And this is contained in a CSV file. And so if you want to have multiple different sea level curves, you need to provide multiple different sea level curve CSV files. Um, same here with the initial topography, uh, which is the you know, initial state um, at which the simulation starts. But these other values here are um, a unique component that we have incorporated into here. So these scenarios are these categorical variables that incorporate um, multiple different uh, pieces within the Badlands XML 
So within the Badlands XML input file, there's some um, multiple different values that you can have throughout it. But for some of these things, like, um, like let's just say like, let's take M here. Um, for this, you could have multiple different numeric values that you could be using. But for other components, you could have these large fields where there can be you know, definitions of different types of events occurring. And you may not want to have every single one of those values varying. And so you may have a particular hypothesis that you might want to test where you're having a set of parameter values within that whole chunk. That's what these scenarios are. And so I'll provide some more specific examples. So yeah, a scenario is where you want to define a whole set of values or a set of different situations. And to, to really get a better idea about what all um, you can include as a different scenario, really, I think it's best to go look over the whole Badlands um, XML input section on the Badlands website. And one of the example um, scenarios is precipitation. So with precipitation, you can define um, multiple different sets of, you know, types of precipitation that you want to simulate. You can define different uh, precipitation events, different like simulate different uh, precipitation grids. There's a whole lot of different options within the precipitation field within the Badlands XML. And so instead of having each one of those different uh, parameters as a variable you want to, you know, run through DWGen, instead you can define a whole set of precipitation values that represent a reasonable scenario that you want to simulate the effects of in your Badlands model. And so here's the example using one of the other um, scenarios that we've incorporated for this Rift model. This is with uh, the tectonic displacement. And so in this case, uh, we have two different scenario XML files. And this is just little snippets of it. But basically, one of these scenarios is using a high displacement um, grid here, which is in a CSV file that you provide as the data folder. The other one is using a low displacement grid um, that's in a CSV file here. So these basically, you know, these are two different scenarios where you're using two different sets of data files, depending on the different scenario that you're using. And what happens is that um, basically our um, DOE Gen to Badlands converter, it will take these XML scenario snippets and paste them into, the, into a template Badlands XML input file that we've created and then produce that for each one of your different experimental design um, parameter sets that you get from DOHN. And we've tried to make this so that it's user customizable because um, the Rift model that we've worked with is relatively simple, but there's a lot of different parameters and different things you can simulate, a lot of different um, like geological processes that you can simulate with Badlands. And the Rift model doesn't include all of those different features or um, so basically, if you want to expand upon this, you can make some changes to the, this particular Python script, where if you want to incorporate more or more elements of scenarios or change the scenarios that exist. So yeah, basic, so that's what, the, that's what these scenario XML snippets are. So the next stage in um, running the pipeline is to create the project folders and files. So the way we're suggesting to do this is to copy the, this is project template folder that we have in the, um, the folder pipeline. Uh, that's where we want to have it. And then you just rename it to whatever project you want to call it. So exam for example, project Rift. And in our GitHub repository, you can see there already is a project Rift folder there, but this is, this is that's an example of how the template can be used. Then you want to make sure that all of your data files and your scenario files are in there. So you want to make sure that everything that's referenced in this experimental design setup Excel spreadsheet is actually there. So um, that includes all of the different, you know, sea level curves or initial topography grids that you're wanting to look at, and also all the different uh, displacement or precipitation maps that you might want to have. And yeah, you can adjust the maximum number of runs 
that you want to potentially look at in this settings design badlands yaml file the next step that you need to do is make sure that you have docker running and so a simple way to have docker running on your computer is just using docker desktop that's a pretty easy way to do it and one of the little tips with using docker if you don't if you're not already aware of it is to make sure that you um, tell docker to use um, the amount of resources that you might want to give it uh, because by default, I think Docker only uses like eight gigs of RAM. And if you're lucky enough to have a computer with a lot of RAM, you can run things a lot faster if you tell Docker to use all your RAM or all your cores. Um, but uh, just be careful with that, of course. So once you have all of this set up on your computer and you have Docker running, the next stage is to basically to navigate on your in shell to your repository or to where you've cloned the repository. And then you navigate into the pipeline folder. Then you make sure you have um, the permission set for DOGEN Badlands shell script, and then you run the shell script. And this will go through and run. It will um, run all of the Docker files in sequence. It'll create the set, the optimum table of experiments from DOHN. It will pass the output of that into the DOHN to Badlands converter, then pass that all of those XML files and run Badlands simulations for each one, and then save the results. Then the, the next step after that is once you've run all of your simulations and just as a, I guess, as a brief example, I'll just say that I, the other day I ran um, the whole Badlands, um, just this, this stage of it, this shell script, and I ran it, I think I ran 48 experiments, um, so 48 Badlands models. It took me um, 68 minutes on my MacBook, but I have a very powerful MacBook, but that's just an example of how long this can take. So it can still take a little while. Um, but um, the idea here is to is, we'll save a lot of time because using DOE Gen, we've created a um, optimal set of experiments to test rather than running through and testing like a full factorial or something and then having the computer running for years. So this Badlands um, ground truth comparison here, um, basically we want to specify our um, whatever is our ground truth data that we're gonna be using. And we wanna set, you know, say for example, if we're looking at, um, if we wanna test how well our model um, predicted or, you know, actually simulated the outcome um, elevation or sediment thickness or whatnot, this is where we set that there in that variable. Um, and an important thing to note here is that um, currently, you're required to have the ground truth and into in the same um, spatial coordinate system as the whatever you're using for everything, the inputs that are being fed into the Badlands simulation. So it needs to match up. We don't handle any conversion between coordinate systems. And to run this analysis, it's just as relatively simple as the whole process of running the initial bit of the pipeline. It's just you move here and then you run the script and then it takes care of it all for you. And this saves a bunch of different output analysis files that um, I think Seb will describe a little bit more. So what the, I guess the, the first bit of the results file you get is you get the top 10 experiments and in this case, we're looking at based at how well our simulations um, are modeling elevation for our models. And so this gives you the top 10 of them. And you can see the basic in root mean root mean square error, which is what we're using here as the uh, metric that we want to compare. And so RMSC is in the units that um, of whatever thing that we're trying to simulate. That's why it's a really nice thing to compare here. And we can see that this particular experiment here was the best one. And we can see the different values for the different parameters that are provided. We can see that the 
this precipitation scenario, this tectonic scenario, and all these other values, that these were the best ones there. Um, Seb, did you want to provide some more explanation? Um, or? Sure. I mean, uh, yeah, one of the not important um, another step is the feature importance or factor importance, which is very basic here. So basically, um, how it's evaluated, it's model agnostic. Um, so, so basically, take the the mean values for each factor level for each factor, and and look for the maximum range uh, between the minimum and maximum. So basically, how much the response variable changes um, for a certain factor. And that can be plotted here on the right side. Um, basically, here in this case, tectonic has the largest range um, by far, has the biggest impact on, on the response elevation, uh, followed by yeah, the N and M and the elastic thickness and so on. Yeah, and I guess in it's one this is a, a nice thing to look at as well, because it does kind of make sense because if we were to think about back into our parameters. The tectonic scenarios we're comparing between three very different, um, you know, this like low, medium, and high different scenarios for uh, tectonic displacement. So yeah, it does make sense that you'd see a big difference in the final elevation there. Uh, and yeah, I guess the interpretation of this is kind of similar if you've done random forest models before. It's kind of similar to variable mm -hmm. forest plots. Really. Yeah, yeah. I'll talk a bit more about. Yeah, we can mention other models that that I'm. Important for feature importance later too. Yeah. Um, should I go ahead? Or, yeah, go ahead. Sir. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, here another step and just quick analyze step is to see uh, uh, to check the correlation between each factor and, and the response variable. Yeah, in this case was elevation. Um, we see here um, not a significant effect. Uh, for some reasons, the tectonic is here taken out probably because it's a categorical variable. Um, and the same uh, plot is done for the RMSE value on the next slide. Um, similar plot, um, it's a violin chart. So we see the entire distribution. You can see for which uh, level setting um, the RMSE has been the lowest. Um, this is not very revealing here, I have to admit, on this plot. Um, so it's probably good to look just at the mean values which are, which are indicated as well. Um, or um, one important plot is also the uh, looking at the pairwise. Um, Combination so pairwise factor combination um, uh, with respect to the uh, response variable elevation. Yeah, so we can see here uh, we can see here on the bottom tectonic um, scenarios have the the largest impact again as as, as we mentioned before on the uh, factor importance plot is the largest impact on the response variable. Um, but in principle, it's good. Yeah, of course we are only three settings, so there's it's not um, much of a correlation you can see in those plots, but you can possibly identify a couple of patterns here for certain um, pairwise correlations, for instance, um, that have enough or interaction effects in this case. And the same plot we have also as function of the uh, RMSE values. So we can see here uh, whether there's a certain um, subspace in, in the RMSE value just here. That's basically just a slice, a two-dimensional slice for the, for the hypercube of the parameter space. And this corner plot, whether there's a certain um, Minimum value of RMS E parameter settings. This can be due to some interaction effects. And again, the yeah, there's a large uh, variation here for the tectonic um, scenario as well. Yeah, um, yeah. I just wanted to mention uh, a few points uh, and recommendations maybe that go behind the basic analyzer steps, uh, which is very generic um, because it has to deal with a lot of scenarios. But often, um, obviously, the analyzer will depend on the the specific simulation and, and what you would like to achieve in the research. So one obvious thing is obviously an uh, important thing is the residual analyzers. Um, since you have geospatial uh, simulations, mostly uh, spatial coordinates, it makes sense to create a spatial map of the response and of, of course of the residual areas as well as the RMSE map. So you could check, for instance, whether there are certain locations um, or outliers on a map and check in um, if, there's, if there's anything um, going on there or um, look for certain, yeah, it's good for look, checking for outliers, for instance. Um, one interesting approach is, for instance, if you'd like to build a surrogate model. Um, so basically, it is possible to approximate this very complex simulation if you have enough data points with a surrogate model, which can be implemented, for instance, via neural networks or partially also through random forests. This allows you, um, once you have such kind of approximation model, 
to uh, create uh, predictions and on much faster time scales in terms of new networks once it's trained, it just takes a fraction of a second instead of hours. And has also the advantage that you can use those um, circuit models uh, for, for feature selection um, and for instance, or feature range selection um, um, that you can use once then in a subsequent experimental design setup if you only select then after you have the insert of the experiment, of the global scale of parameters, you might select only a few parameters that you want to fine tune in and in the ranges. Um, the other option is so what to do next after this DOGEN step. So you could either, as mentioned, um, run another experiment design with some fine tuned parameters, or you, you go towards uh, like an iterative optimization scheme. So you want to um, uh, optimize a certain parameter range uh, either locally uh, with gradient descent, which could take a bit longer, or via Bayesian optimization, um, I would like to build an objective function uh, that takes into account, for instance, the, the RMSE. Um, across the hypercube of parameters. Um, yeah, and let's summarize the talk and before we can go to the discussion, um, just a quick recap. Um, we've presented here in this, this seminar talk, a quick uh, overview about the open source pack package um, for design of, agenda, uh, design of uh, experiment generation and analysis, your gem, as well as the integrated pipeline uh, for Badlands. And one of the highlights I think that, uh, that Henry was working on. And, and I think it's um, very different to the general um, experiment of design principles that um, the user is able to define and test custom simulation scenarios as, as XML snippets. So basically take into account any, any prior knowledge of dependencies between different factors or if they are like mutually exclusive or mutually dependent. Um, the entire package is, as mentioned, very easy to install either via Docker or you want to set it up in your own Python environment uh, via requirement and setup file. And we also built the entire package um, focusing on the aspects, um, basically having a modular built environment. So all different steps are, have their own scripts and are dockerized on their own. Uh, so it's very easy for any user to, to edit, um, swap or, or add any custom models. And they're, I think, all available now on the Earthbyte GitHub repository and hope we'll go in the future through your contributions. So um, thank you very much for your attention and uh, happy to answer any questions and any other points that you would like to discuss.